Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us today in our next in the series of Aim for Inclusion. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Wendy Burkhart. Wendy is uh, in high desert. She works with uh, a number of districts. She's gonna tell us a bit more about herself and her background, but assistive technology is uh, Wendy's uh, forte. She's going to be telling us about how to find AIM, um, that meets your students' goals, your students' needs, and where we can go to search for those sources. And I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to ask Wendy to start sharing and tell us about some of the sources for AIM. Thank you for being here. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Wendy Burkhart. I am an assistive technology specialist over in Bend, area. But um, apart from that, um, I serve our, our team of five specialists and two AT assistants, uh, serve um, a wide region going as far no north up to the Columbia River, um, as far east as Harney County out in Burns and Crane area, and then um, our central location. So uh, I have been in this field for the last uh, 15 years um, and have been in special education for over 25. So uh, today's discussion though is going to be about AIM and where do we find this more on a global organizational level um, as we will let Bruce uh, dive into those teacher created materials next month. So where do we really start? So um, I, as you know, this is who I am, and I've given you a little bit of background. Um, and today, just wanted to think about those three big things that I hope you gain from this presentation is uh, where to start to find AIM. And we will define what AIM is shortly if you are new to the series and have not heard of this term. Um, we're also going to know how to set up a student and a team to know where and how to use AIM, and then at the end, be able to gather some new resources and some new information to take with you to the teams that you serve. So with that, let's really talk first about accessibility. I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, particular uh, picture or cartoon. Uh, it is of a, a gentle person. Uh, shoveling the stairs and there's a ramp on the left hand side and the students are saying could you please shovel the ramp specifically the student in the wheelchair and the gentleman is person is saying you know well you know all these other kids are just waiting for the stairs I'll get to yours next but really if we shovel the ramp everybody can access so if we really think of aim accessible educational materials as that ramp for all students, yes, it is required for students with specific disabilities, but if we provide those accessibility options, there are so many more students that will benefit from the use of these types of materials. And so when we go into school districts and we're going into uh, areas in which we want to help support teachers implement AIM, Sometimes we run across those barriers of uh, teachers or um, schools not quite understanding it as a ramp and seeing it that that's just an add on. But in reality, if we can change the mindset that using AIM, using accessible educational materials actually uh, will help and benefit our students who are English language learners, our students who are tier one interventions, our students that are at risk. It's not just the students on an IEP or a 504, but really can be brought in to support all students. But really, what is AIM? If you um, are new to this series and you haven't heard the definitions, this is probably a, a great layman term. There's lots of technical terms for ac accessible educational materials, but really, if you were to tell someone on the street what AIM is, you could say that it's materials that are designed or converted in a way that make them usable across the widest ranges of students. So it's taking things like digital textbooks, audiobooks, 
closed captioning, print materials that have more graphics to it. Those are all accessible educational materials. It's not just paper and pencil, it's our videos, it's the, the podcasts. Do we have a transcript of that podcast as well for those that might be deaf and hard of hearing? So really taking into consideration multiple ways of providing that information to students. And so while AIM has, is here, it also has the backing of three legal frameworks. Obviously, IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, really um, Ham talks about that having accessible educational materials. And in if you're in Oregon, most districts, not all, most districts have that as a legal requirement on their special factors page. So again, if you've gone through this series and you've heard about um, how to write it on the IEP, you would see that typically in section G on the special factors page. If you're a district that has the synergy framework, uh, what we are, um, many of us in our region are asking uh, is that in the assistive technology section in the synergy framework is where you would be writing in those AIM accommodations as well, just to make sure that teams are still considering it um, and keeping it there for, for all to see. Um, obviously, we also have the section 504, uh, which again is this more of the civil end of um, accessibility in the educational realm and then our American with Disabilities Act. So these big three are the three that really start to embrace and give some meat as to why uh, legally we need to have accessible educational materials. So, but where do we find AIM? Where do we find those sources? And so I picture it as a triangle at the very bottom in our state, in Oregon, we are going to start with ODE, with the Oregon Department of Ed Curriculum and Instructional Learning Department. They have already gone through the curriculum that has been vetted and, and determined for a variety of uh, reasons, which ones are accessible and relevant for our state. So as a district or as someone within a district, you can be assured that if you are taking curriculum from the state adopted texts and the state adopted curriculum, that they have already been vetted and approved and meet the accessibility standards that are required for our students with disabilities. Um, on top of that, in January uh, of this year, uh, there is now uh, some regulations stating that any publisher that brings material into the state is now required to bring an accessibility report to every district. So if your district chooses not to use the ODE approved curriculum and they choose to do an independent uh, curriculum adoption, they will still, those publishers will still be required to provide you an accessibility report on their curriculum. So I really start with, you know, I, my personal piece is, is, wow, ODE's already done a lot of that heavy lifting for us as districts and as, as teachers. We can really look at that as knowing that they have done their due diligence when it comes to the accessibility pieces. Um, but if, again, for some reason your, your district um, chooses to do something different, we will go into ways that they can get that supported as well. Next, if we if we were going up the chain of the uh, triangle, there is the OER Commons, and we will be looking at these links in a little bit as well, but you have access to these slides and hyperlinks at the same time. So the OER Commons, um, there is a national OER Commons. It's an open registry that um, teachers and professionals can be putting materials of all kinds in there. Um, and um, creating accessible media. And Oregon has its own statewide one as well. And there are lots of subgroups and ways that you can search through the OER Commons to gather um, educationally relevant material. 
once we've gone broad and we're starting to narrow locally, as we will be talking a little bit about our districts, uh, you have your, your district curriculum department and instructional department, uh, whether you're a small district in which that there's one person that does multiple tasks, or you're in a large district that curriculum is different than teaching and technology, and you have various groups that are needing to come together, uh, that would be the next area that as a teacher or as a specialist, we could start asking those questions to um, the people within the curriculum department about the accessibility features and how are we making sure that the media and uh, curriculum that we're sending out is robust for our students. And then at the very top of our triangle, as we have created these layers of accessibility, if we still have areas in which students are not able to get materials accessible, um, particularly uh, textbooks or your core literature books, we have access to uh, national libraries such as Bookshare and Learning Ally. Bookshare and Learning Ally were in a prior uh, webinar, but so we will touch on them briefly. Um, if you have not um, experienced that webinar, it is recorded through OTAP as well. So I will mention them, but I will not go as in depth as potentially they did in the prior webinar. So those are some general sources to go through. And we're going to go into sort of next that process of what it's, um, if you're not taking that curriculum that ODE has um, already approved, um, how we go through that process to make sure that the curriculum that comes into our districts and for our students is accessible and um, we can really feel good that our students are getting what they need. Um, so these are just some things that um, over the years that I've experienced and that uh, many of us across the state are continuing to advocate with our school districts and publishers that really um, when we go to a, a curriculum department, many of them are not going to have the lens of accessibility. It's not that they don't want accessibility. That's just not something that lives in their world right now. Many of us in assistive technology or in the special education field, we sort of live and breathe uh, what that uniqueness is for our students. And so making sure that we have someone that's on the adoption committee that has that lens of accessibility and looking at it from a student perspective of how does this piece of curriculum interplay and interact as a student? How would the student navigate through this piece of curriculum. And so really just coming alongside that curriculum department or curriculum person um, to really start looking at those materials, um, reminding the, the uh, curriculum people of the approved um, ODE curriculum that is out there in case there are ones that they want to look at and consider, uh, then we can bring those alongside. And then, Recently, we have experienced in one of our larger districts um, coming alongside the head librarian or the head media specialist um, of the district and really starting to talk more about the resources that the media department has, um, the librarians have both in your local region of your local libraries, as well as what purchasing power uh, the district, the head media specialists have in purchasing audiobooks and purchasing and supporting students with those accessibility needs. And then as we get into those educational partnerships, those publishers that come to us really asking those questions and um, going through that process of um, pinpointing the need for accessible digital materials to be a part of that curriculum package as districts are starting to come up with curriculum adoptions, really making sure that that is one of the selling points that this um, educational publisher would be providing uh, so that they come prepared 
to answer the questions uh, when we go through the interview process. And again, as we've talked about, there are the Bookshare and Learning Allies, AIM repositories. I don't wanna say those are last resort, but those are more specialized um, for specific students. And so if we can really create that ramp that provides those accessible features, it will reach a broader audience. Um, and then we can supplement um, for those really specific students or specific learning needs um, with the um, AIM repositories such as Bookshare and Learning Ally. So now that we've had this broad scope of resources, how do we really dig down boots on the ground um, in our schools when we have a student who go, is in middle school, high school, has seven different teachers, and they have lots of different textbooks and curriculum going. Well, one of the things that we have used and developed through the years is called an AIM Student Planning Worksheet. And with this, I'm gonna give you, um, show you a little bit of what it looks like. Again, you have the link to this and can feel free to download it and use it within your district as well. So here we would put up and we would have the student name, grade, you would get your team together. You may not be able to get every single teacher, but maybe you're sitting with a case manager, you're sitting um, alongside a couple of the gen ed teachers. And as a team, you've already determined what format the student is going to be using and or formats, because it could be that they need audio and digital text. Or, um, or they need large print and audio and digital text depending on the student's needs. So of course, we'd be writing that down. We would be finding out maybe which textbooks they're going to be using. Many of them anymore are embedded digitally, which is great to see, but it's good to have, okay, this is the exact textbook. And the reason we would put down the exact name, even if you can get the ISBN number, is because of the Bookshare and Learning Ally repositories, we can actually get the exact textbook, but we would need to know which ISBN number it is because there are a lot of Health 2 textbooks out there. So being able to know which one to download. There may be other books, especially if you're looking in our history and in some of our language arts classrooms, you're gonna have a lot of um, more literature that you're going to be using. Uh, are we using handouts or worksheets? You may be saying some are paper. You don't have to write down every handout or worksheet, but really you'd be talking about, is it, paper, is it found electronically? Is it found on a learning management system like Canvas or School Loop or uh, Google Classroom? Where are you going to be able to find those worksheets for that student? And then will you be using other things like YouTube videos, or are you using Desmos or different uh, web-based activities? Um, just so we can also make sure that those are interplaying well with uh, the resources the student has. And then as a team, you could be talking, you could break down those actual classes um, and start talking about who's going to help implement that. Maybe it's the case manager is going to make sure that the student is signed up for Bookshare. And if you have an AT specialist or an AT team within your district, maybe they're gonna make sure that the student, if they're in an iOS district, has the appropriate apps to support text-to-speech. If you're in a Chrome district, maybe you're using a specific extensions uh, for the student to access that um, textbook and handouts and worksheets. So you can start to develop that plan of um, who's gonna do what in each class. Um, it could be that the teacher is turning on the closed captioning for, for all the videos that are being presented as well. So this planning worksheet has been really helpful in, um, in supporting teams to divvy up the work, to not feel that it's extremely overwhelming and to have a plan in place when it comes to uh, 
using materials and providing materials that are accessible. Um, obviously, if the student is a middle school or high school student when you're using this, um, certainly inviting them to be a part of that process of using what tools do you want to use? Do you feel comfortable using a low tech tool in science class or math class versus having a Chromebook or a, a digital device in those classes? And so really creating that conversation uh, can help the student feel supported as well as teachers not feeling as overwhelmed with trying to provide something that they feel is maybe more than, than what they've typically done. So this is a, a great worksheet to be able to uh, to again, to highlight what it looks like. And I'll show you all an example of one that's been filled out for a, a student in our area. Um, this student was a while ago when we did this one, uh, but we also showed that we did the protocols and accommodations of reading, which is um, a wonderful assessment. It's digitally done anymore. Uh, and it really can show a student's decoding versus comprehension skills. Um, that is a whole webinar in and of itself. But just know that um, that protocols for accommodations for reading is um, a great way to gain information about where that student's comprehension level is. And we were able to see that that student who is a 10th grade student um, was able to have understand and comprehend ninth grade level text uh, when given text to speech. And so even though his dec this person's decoding skills was at a third grade decoding, their comprehension was at almost at grade level. So that's always really helpful, I think, too, for teachers to understand that even though that student that is being presented to them in a, is a quote unquote non-reader, they actually have a lot higher comprehension given when they're given accessible materials. So again, you can see some of the things that the team wrote down that they were using for this particular student. And then we went through and talked about the different worksheets and it sort of gave us some idea, okay, there's gonna be several paper handouts per week. At this point, we would probably bring in the student to say, how do you want those handouts done? Do you want to use like a little scanning pen or do you need these copied into um, from the copy machine and put into digital format? And here uh, the science teacher said that they would choose to scan into Google Drive because then they'd have a digital copy themselves and could share it with other students. So again, this sort of highlights how we did a rough sketch of, and we knew that things would come up throughout the school year, but at least this was a good starting point of getting things going for the student and who would be working on uh, following up throughout the year. So I was going to dive into a couple uh, case studies just to give you examples of things that have gone on and how um, how that flow happened. Of, um, and so this first one is a young high school student. She started actually in fourth grade using uh, assistive technology. This young lady uh, came and when I started working with her, um, had a paperback book of pictures of every single book she wanted to read in her life. Um, time at that point and said, someday I will get there, but right now I'm not smart because I can't read. So we're going to fast forward. She was a student who um, was in a school, very small school district. Um, we were fortunate enough to get um, through their AT services an iOS device for her and in a district that used more iOS devices. And then she, uh, in middle school, went to a even smaller school district, but they had one-to-one -one Chromebooks. So at that point she chose, because she was already used to a tool of using an iPad, to use um, an iPad for a while to um, understand her textbooks and her novels. 
And um, then we started that training process of using the Chromebook for those digital things that her teachers were starting to put on Google Classroom. And then as the years have progressed, she uh, now has is a junior in high school and navigates a couple different devices based on her needs. So uh, she uses uh, her iOS devices for reading the novels. She finds that Voice Dream and the Dolphin Reader apps are more intuitive to her than trying to do Bookshare on a computer. Um, and then at the beginning of the school year, she meets um, the team meets with Charlie and we review her courses and we talk with her about, okay, these are more paper-based um, and she will ask for them to be uh, scanned so that she can use them on her Chromebook. And then many of the textbooks are already digitally provided, um, but for anything that isn't, she has her own Bookshare account and logs in to her Bookshare account on her iPad and downloads the book into the app. Um, and then for anything that uh, is more uh, worksheet based, she prefers to use her Chromebook because then she can edit on those worksheets and um, access it that way. Uh, she also will use her phone. Um, most schools right now are not using allowing students their cell phones out, but Given that the student has an accommodation um, for she was able to use her phone to quickly scan something on the wall using a free app called Seeing AI. Um, it works on an iPad as well, but it's a little more discreet to hold up a phone quickly, listen to something and put it back in your pocket than a big, huge iPad. So she's those are things that through the years, through coaching and training and support, she's been able to uh, sort of navigate um, how AIM looks for her and um, what tools and supports she needs um, as she heads into her post-secondary, uh, looking into post-secondary. So this was sort of after the fact. So curriculum was already um, addressed. You know, we teachers, it's a small, it was a small enough school district that everybody knew everybody and some of those resources were already there. But what happens if you're in a maybe a bigger school district or you're in an area in which um, that they're just starting that curriculum adoption? So this is sort of aim from the beginning. How did we get aim already infused into a curriculum? So first of all, find out uh, when those curriculum adoptions are, and if possible, uh, ask to be a part of that committee. Hey, I, I have some a lens of accessibility. How can I um, be a part of the team? Um, what can I do to support this adoption or give feedback? And um, usually if you open that door, people are pretty open to uh, having you be a part of it, or at least providing some feedback. Um, well, what um, I've experienced is that even though the accessibility reports come in, and I am so grateful that that is now a requirement in Oregon, you need to have someone on the team who understands what that means. Um, whether it's a special education teacher, an assistive technology specialist, maybe even someone from your information technology or IT team uh, could have. So it doesn't have to always be an AT specialist, but somebody who understands the terminology in that accessibility report um, needs to be help, helping on that adoption committee. Um, and uh, we will be providing you a resource to help sort of weed through that accessibility report that was created in Hood River. And with um, her permission, I am going to be sharing that with you all shortly. Um, but it was a nice way to sort of encapsulate the accessibility features of um, a curriculum and put some numbers to it 
in the uh, so when those adoption committees as the whole committee comes together can look at it they need to have something to quantify because um, anecdotal data is really challenging for committees to to wrap their heads around especially on an area like accessibility that they may not be as versed in so again going back to that accessibility option of um when those publishers come in and asking those questions ahead of time um, to the publishers to ensure that everybody is hearing from the publisher about those accessibility needs and how they're going to help support uh, those features in their curriculum. When do we have a, a question from oh. Brittany? Oh, sorry. And, um, and that's quite all right. I'm here to help you in monitoring. But Brittany says that she was totally that person on the uh, curriculum committee in her district. She had the voice for accessibility and they went ahead and purchased something that wasn't accessible. Um, in, in your um, experience, um, that's probably fairly common. Do you have any ideas or tips for Brittany? Um, well, I'm really sorry that First of all, that that happened to you as being the voice that was there and then the voice that was not heard. Um, I, I guess my my tip is actually more of a wondering um, to go back to that. I'd be curious if it that had happened to me, I probably would have gone and asked some questions as to why. And maybe you did. Why this curriculum when we know that it's not accessible? Um, over that. And uh, many times we don't get to be a part of those curriculum adoption committees, and we do come across ones that are inaccessible. At that point, it becomes more of a, a reactive strategy of then now we need to find apps or things that can hope extensions that will convert it more readily. And um, those pieces and then um, really going back to those uh, special ed directors or those administrators, those people who make those decisions saying, I, you know, this is, this is not accessible. How are we going to make this right? Um, because by law, and I hate to throw that out, but sometimes that's what gets uh, administrators thinking is, well, by law, we need this to be accessible. So what what can we do to problem solve this? Um, and that sometimes means having to purchase, you know, items to retrofit the curriculum. And when they see that happen, sometimes the, sh the mindset will shift the next go around. That's been eight years of, of, challenge in the making to our first time having an accessible curriculum available. So it's very slow going, um, but I don't know if that helps at all with <laughs> some of the things we've experienced. I think you're right on, Wendy. We hope that people will hear these things and do the right thing because it is the right thing to do, making sure it's insured. Um, and we hate to pull the law card, but it is written in law. Uh, you can go back to probably our very first webinar that we did in October in explaining AIM um, and find some of those resources uh, for uh, the laws that you might want uh, to quote. Uh, to the people who are deciding otherwise. We know that there is state guidance, there is uh, national guidance, and it's still the decision is up to districts. And, right, and, and so they move forward with that, making sure that they are informed about all the ins and outs. Wendy, as you said, that's, that's really what we, all we can do at this point. Yeah, and it's a, I think what our team has experienced a lot um, this particular year is there's so much what we all believe what we have is top priority and um, learning not to take it personal um, when we all want to do what's best for students. Um, our idea of what is a top priority may not be the same idea of what a SPED director's top priority is or 
a curriculum directors or our IT department's top priority. Um, some IT departments will look at curriculum and be concerned about safety and security and making sure that students' and personal information is not put out on the web. And so we're looking at all these little pieces of a puzzle and they sometimes don't fit nicely at first and trying to understand um, there might be some comp compromise that we have to give with accessibility for that safety and security piece, if that also means that we get a little more understanding of each other's roles um, in that process. So again, then we're, we get closer to finding the right fit for our students. Um, and Brittany kind of went on to say that you know the team seemed to choose um, the cheaper um, materials rather than go with the accessible materials, and and that they are relying on the OTs and teachers to do the retrofitting. And so I think that maybe even showing uh, the cost of that retrofitting and how long it took you to leave the room and go to a copier and, and you know, if they're looking at dollars, look at how often that has to happen uh, with a workbook uh, and how many pages a person's going to have to leave the room if the dollar signs are what are talking to them, maybe doing a little bit of study on uh, how much they're not saving uh, would be helpful. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think I was just going to say, put together a little spreadsheet of cost analysis of, you know, I get paid $120 an hour, or whatever the going rate is, if we broke down our, hourly, our, our salary into hourly wage, we could say I spent this much time doing, or if your district chooses to use an ESD for some of their, their services, being able to say we're spending this much time creating this is this what you want to spend district your money on or did you want us to be serving in a different capacity so i mean those are the conversations that are sometimes above our pay grade and more at that administrative level but certainly giving feedback to our administrators on how to approach if you're working not in a district but like in an ESD or some type of regional program um, being able to have those discussions um, as well. Um, this is an ideal. This was this case study happened last year for the first time in eight years um, in one of our larger districts. And it's not by any means perfect, but um, we are just now in that cusp of getting into the um, IT department and the head library. The head librarian is wanting to know about Bookshare She's uh so you finding those those champions um it could be a librarian at one of the schools it could that is really passionate or one of your tech people is really passionate finding those champions to come alongside that want to support you and then they will take it to their supervisors and up that chain um into making it more accessible for students um one of the i'm just going to go into some supports one of the things that i did want to mention i'm not sure if everybody has access to this i know um, our district one of our districts in our region uses a platform called sora s-o-a-r and it's connected to the local public library system but it's managed so students don't have free-for-all access to every book in the local public library system, but they are able to then check out books. They are able to purchase in our library funding options. That's sort of the, the single sign-on for audiobooks. So that, um, that Ben Lapine, that one of our bigger districts in our region uses. And so that if your district has something like that, like a Sora app or some type of centralized library system, uh, that would be a great place to start. The librarians do have funds available to purchase books. We are finding out that they do can purchase audiobooks available and we have access to some 
libraries in Seattle and in, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, that students can get access to a free library card during that. And so if their library doesn't have a particular audio book, human voice book, you can check out the books in those libraries and they are can be filtered through your district's uh, library system. So that uh, if you're working a lot, able to work alongside slowly, even if it's with one librarian or media specialist at a school, they we have like uh, media specialists now that are giving those audio books top priority to students on 504s and IEPs because they see that they need that as an accessible educational material. Again, going back to that student AIM worksheet, being able to show that to the librarian or media specialist and say, hey, where can I get this just outside of Bookshare? Are there, are there options for the student to be able to check out a book here at, at this school with an audio format? And, and through those champions and being able to bring in more of those audio books and uh, digital books for students. Um, so I'm going to share with you a few things that we have done, things that um, we've looked, uh, talked a little bit already about the ODE Instructional Materials Toolkit. Um, these are all hyperlinked for you. Um, other options um, are the Oregon Textbook and Media Center. It's our state uh, media center and textbooks, uh, the OER Commons. And if we have some time, we can actually dig into these and show you those sites. Uh, Bookshare, uh, again, it is a, a national library um, specific for students with uh, disabilities and fi on, or on a 504 and mostly have a digital text. Um, they do have some audio books um, and it, most of it is computer-based voice. Um, but again, there are some that are still human voice in the audio format. Um, Learning Ally, uh, there is um, cost involved and in that is currently for uh, districts to purchase. So if you're with an ESD or a regional program of some sort, um, that is not something that it, we as a regional program can purchase, but we can recommend and show districts um, to do that. And that has more human voice uh, to that. Um, the AIM worksheet you saw, and then I will briefly show you the accessibility review of instructional materials. So I'm gonna uh, show you this is uh, what was created by one of our uh, AIM cohort uh, districts that has been a part of this and uh, referencing Karen Holt, who it comes out of Hood River. When I was going through the uh, curriculum adoption process, I reached out to her and she had had a wonderful uh, instructional materials and resources review sheet. Uh, she um, allowed me some rights to um, add to it and we, uh, added some rating scales as well as um, the total for digital versions. So then you can tally up that total um, and give um, this sheet to your curriculum um, adoption committee, um, ideally to work alongside um, IT so they can see this as well. But worst case, at least they get it passed on to them so they know they know all the lingo um, alongside we do. So this um, really goes into cross-referencing anything that's given in that accessibility report. And then when we go through that curriculum adoption to be able to play with each one. And um, what I experienced um, recently was that not all publishers had a student facing account. They would give us teacher versions where we could see how to teach the curriculum, but there were a few that we really had to say, hey, we won't look at you until you provide us with a student facing account so that we can have the student experience. We need to see how the students will interact with this particular program, especially on the digital platform. 
So you can see that there is a, a lot that's here to, uh, to review and go through um, and a place to write notes. So just know that if you're looking for a way to, to analyze curriculum, either curriculum that's being used right now or curriculum that is um, coming into your district through the beginning stages, then uh, you know, that is available to you uh, through uh, Hood River. So um, one of the things, this is something that we, um, our team has created uh, recently to provide to teachers uh, different ways where they can find accessibility options. This is currently what one school district, our larger school district uses. Um, you can certainly take this if it's similar to you or uh, use it as a template and create your own. Uh, but we really talked about, you know, what is, what are these uh, areas you can find accessible curriculum first within your school environment and then what we have outside. So like I spoke of, we, uh, this district uses Sora, which is more of a uh, specific single sign-on to get um, some books. We have Epic um, Hoopla, which is usually a part of any uh, library system is your Hoopla and your, your OverDrive and Libby. So those again are a part of, of the public library system um, that have great accessibility features. And then if those basic features for all students don't work for the students we're serving, then we can go into the more specific apps or extensions that are needed. Um, so currently we just have a uh, bookshare on there um, because um, our districts uh, currently do not uh, partake in Learning Ally. So um, we try to also then give links. So again, this is a, a resource um, that you can try and use or replicate as needed uh, for, your, for your districts. Uh, I will briefly show the uh, OER Commons, and then um, I know we have until 4.15, so I wanted to leave some time for additional questions, answers, stories um, that we can um, can all engage in. So our last one, just if you've not taken a look at the um, OER Commons, I, I posted a link for our um, Oregon Accessible Educational Materials section in the OER Commons. So in just if you want to know more about AIM um, and resources, or you have um, colleagues or people that you're trying to uh, support uh, learning about AIM, this is where you can find all the procurement that OTAP and the AIM cohort have put together. Uh, so you will have all of those pieces here. So if you're looking for data collection, you're looking for resource allocation, you're, you're looking for things in school libraries, use of instructional materials, you just click on it. You have your different areas that you can go into. And then you have your different uh, things that you can uh, either send as a link or that you can download and use. So while I gave you the link to the AIM piece, you can go ahead and discover and search in a, a wide variety of topics. So if you're looking for something in you know, the science world, um, for fifth grade, you can put in those search features and it will bring things up for you. So what are you looking for? Science, it's going to give you the subject, life science, uh, upper primary, and then you can search and it will give you materials that you would be able to use, download, and if you make any additions to it, you can always re-upload uh, it for someone to see those revisions.
So something else for us to sort of dig in, um, that's another free resource for us. Uh, so think of it in some ways as, as a teacher pay teachers, but for those that are in Oregon um, and have um, a little bit more uh, continuity on accessibility options there. Lastly, uh, these are the two libraries that we recently found out about, the uh, Brooklyn Public Library. You can get a digital card it's for anybody um, that's 13 and older, uh, just due to the internet rights um, and privacy laws that are around there. So uh, 13 is that age that students can start using these um, digital libraries. But that's actually can be really good for students who are in that middle school, high school, and they're struggling to find things either in their local library or at their schools or teachers don't have enough uh, purchasing power to, to get those. And for some reason, maybe Bookshare um, doesn't have it. I have very few books Bookshare has not had in a timely manner. Um, so, but this is just another option for students to be able to use and teachers to use. So um, at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, sort of put it out now for uh, questions, uh, stories, anything that uh, uh, we would like to discuss during the last 15 minutes or so of this presentation. Wendy, you mentioned that your district or your ESD is not using Learning Ally, and would would you um, would you say a little bit more about that choice? Um, sure. At this point, um, a couple of years back, Learning Ally uh, changed how they um, work with districts and regions. Um, in the past, Learning Ally would allow uh, districts to sort of purchase so many through our ESD. And so we could get a 20 license and sort of divvy out those licenses to different districts. Um, that um, changed. And now uh, the model that Learning Ally currently has is that they would want ESDs to promote Learning Ally to the districts themselves, and they would want to connect directly more with a school district uh, to create a district-wide model um, instead of the ESD sort of being that intermediary, um, which, and they don't, my understanding is that they, they don't quite see an ESD as a school district because we serve so many. And so our domains look a little different. Um, so at this point, um, if you are not in a school district and you're serving districts, you can certainly let them know of this resource and the, the contact to if they would like to get Learning Ally. One of the things uh, we are looking at is again, that cost analysis when our head librarians and those media specialists are looking at funding and they're having to purchase one to 10 audiobooks, does it make sense to have a subscription to Learning Ally versus having to purchase the books um, there? And so that is that in discussion with one of our districts and then we leave it to them to make that decision on which route they want to take. Currently, because there is a cost to subscription to Learning Ally and Bookshare currently is free, um, our districts are choosing to use Learning Ally or use Bookshare because of that, um, of it being free. Thank you. We know that people are considering money 
And so I just wanted you to, to uh, highlight that. Uh, you all may have a different relationship with districts. Some of you are directly employed by districts, others at ESD. So that's why it may be a bit of a different decision um, if you're supporting from the IS, uh, ESD. Thank you for that, Wendy. Yeah. And, and that's when, when we're really encouraging those, because we know of the cost of really encouraging those librarians and those people in the, in the districts to um, have ways for those human read voices. Um, it's been an ongoing uh, conversation within our region of um, how do we provide that human voice when needed. Um, and to be honest, our data is showing maybe 5%, if that, of students that use um, all of the text-to-speech. Um, there is a very small percentage that cannot use text-to-speech to understand the content. Um, we all prefer that human voice. I love listening to an audiobook with inflection, uh, but is it really, can the student understand and comprehend? And a lot of the voices are becoming a lot more human-like than they have even in the last five years. And I would assume um, if you, any of you are looking at any of the AI content that's coming out um, with all the new adjustments that are going on, I, I'm assuming we will see more human-based computer voices in the future. Any other uh, questions about process or uh, stories, challenges, successes that you've had in your districts or your region um, that could support one another here? I'm wondering, you've gave, given some resources and where you go. I'm wondering if the people on with us today have any additional uh, resources, places that you might go um, when you need text. Feel free to share. And Wendy, we've been talking too about some of the, um, not, not just benefits, but some of the side uh, results of providing kids with the materials that they need, uh, the accessibility. And, and when you talk about somebody who feels that they are not smart because they're na not able to read, I, I just want to point out that those are some of the things that you can't put a, a financial cost on. Uh, you can't put a tag on when somebody has already uh, determined themselves to be a non-reader and their self-esteem starts to go into um, a downward spiral, uh, how do you put a price on um, a student feeling confident in their classroom? I, I, you probably don't have an answer for that. I don't know how. Um, but those are the real hidden costs of not providing accessibility. You're muted. The one time. You know, I need the coffee mug that says you're on mute, right? <laughs> <laughs> After four years uh, of heavy Zoom, we still have to remind ourselves every day. It's quite all right. Um, sorry, where I would, if, if you are interested or you're able to uh, get onto the ATIA uh, site, not this ATIA 2024, but in 2023, there was a presentation done about uh, MTSS and multi-tiered systems of support um, and looking at um, assistive technology aim being side by side. And one of the terms that struck me um, and the, the graph they had was talking about educational trauma for our students that are in those tier one and tier two interventions and they're not getting any accommodations, they're just getting that intervention, they're here, their trajectory is slowly moving up and their student, their friends are up here at the educational and there's this huge gap that those students begin to feel and experience in school 
day after day. And, and so there could be years in which that gap may or may not lessen, but there's still a huge gap that's not being addressed. And that's where the AIM and the accessible accommodations come into play because it bridges the gap between the intervention that a student is receiving and the level that their peers are at. And so it decreases the educational trauma that that student is experiencing. So by the time that they're in fourth grade, every single day, that little microaggression of having a piece of paper they can't read in front of them, it, it lessens that, that hurt inside them by having those accessible educational materials. Um, it lessens the trauma that they're experiencing so they're not under the, under the table um, they're not acting out. They're not the ones that feel different and dig their heels in and cry in the back of the room and people don't know why. So that um, if you are able to, and if I can find that, I will add that as another link, um, as another um, ATIA webinar. It was a, a handout that really spoke if people wanted to look at the data of like true data of what that looks like. That was very, obviously very impactful to me on um, how that works for students. I popped a um, link in the chat. It's not really a place to get textbooks or curriculum that needs to be converted, but the, I, often forget and have to remind myself about the Oslip, Oregon School Library Information System. Um, it's a free resource to, I believe, all Oregon schools, and there's a lot of great accessibility um, built into the tools available there. And if you can convince teachers to use it for some of their lessons, then it is accessible. <laughs> so just thought I'd share that resource. No, thank you. Yes, I was not aware of that. I will pass that on to our team as well. Yeah, you, the start off page, you choose elementary or secondary, and then there's kind of like, um, there's several different uh, places within uh, the, the system there, like a National Geographic for Kids, and there's um, all articles in there, and they have um, accessibility features built into them. And so, yeah. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to bookmark that as well. And I will add that into this handout as well, Jennifer. So then everybody has it if they don't have access to the chat after this. And Wendy, I, I think that when we consider the data that helps to uh, help may help our administrators to understand the importance of AIM, and we look at our traditionally, uh, you know, our marginalized groups of students with disabilities, English learners, and uh, Title I, I shared, and maybe you're not, uh, you may not be able to see it, uh, the graphic that I just put in the um, in the chat, um, but it's about why we prioritize assistive technology and of course AIM uh, goes along with that. Um, and for those students who actually required it uh, for assistive technology, those who required it, those who received it showed graduation rates of 99.8%. Those who required it but never got it, there was a 79.6% difference in graduation rates and then other rates for post-secondary employment. But when we look at uh, the persistence and uh, it keeping our kids motivated. Um, I think that that's some of the data we want to make sure uh, that they're retained. So that's some pretty hard, pretty hard numbers to argue with. Thank you. I was able to download it and um, I was wondering if that one, was that data the one that just came out in the text help email a couple of days ago? Um. I'm not sure that it was in the text help. I have been looking for data that ties uh, AIM and AT to behavior, uh, because when we talk about multi-tiered systems of support, we know that 
uh, as the stories we've been talking about, our kids have higher self-esteem and they uh, feel more engaged and it takes away some of that, uh, that angst that they have over reading. Um, I was looking for that because uh, we, I believe and we believe that uh, tier one should have access and PBIS is a multi-tiered system of support. And so just wanting to make sure that I had data to support that. So I got that from TextHelp. Not sure exactly where that came from, but if y'all have any data uh, supporting that, uh, looking for that as well. I think we have anecdotal stories of how kids come alive whenever they're able to independently read and access materials. So data is probably our best ammunition in going back to our districts and our administrators. And when we consider that money is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest reasons that people may not purchase the accessible materials, I think we need to bring it back to them in terms of dollar signs. So um, sorry about that, Brittany. Um, the, for those who are on today, I will send that photo again or forward it to you um, and share it to with you in a different way. I do see that data presented in, I have it in, in different formats, um, but this is the one that came from TextHelp. So I apologize for that, but everybody that's on today, I'll make sure I send you that, that data. Retention. How do we retain them if they're not engaged and they don't feel part of a bigger picture? 